Hey everybody, just want to thank you uh, for tuning in today to the first episode of Blood Beyond the Razor Wire TV where we take you inside some of the most dangerous, violent prisons in the United States through people's stories. But remember, our mission is to save kids from life imprisonment and premature death. If you haven't hit the subscribe button, go ahead and click on that subscribe button now. I promise to keep you interested and never disappoint you. My first guest is a man that I spent some time with in Big Sandy and USP Lee. I talked about him in my book. He's uh, called, his name is Dog, Dog Pound. Dog, introduce yourself and tell the people who you are. First off, I'd like to say thanks for having me. I appreciate it very much. I respect what you're doing. I admire it and I'm proud of you. Um, my name is Gilbert Stites I'm from New Jersey. They call me Dog Pound. Uh, I met Chad back in 2008, 2009. Um, Big Sandy, USP, Big Sandy. Uh, then we spent some time together in Lee County, Virginia as well, another USP, United States Penitentiary. And uh, he asked me to share my story with you folks today and I'm glad to do it. I appreciate it very much. Where are you from, dog? I'm from South Jersey, uh, 20, 30 minutes from Atlantic City, 20, 30 minutes from Philadelphia. Small little rural town here. And you, uh, you ended up going to federal prison, right? Tell the people, uh, what your charges were and how much time you had. <clears throat> yeah, I was charged with uh, 922G, I believe it is, a uh, felony uh, possession of a firearm. Um, I was selling counterfeit money. They've been dabbling in the life. And uh, when they raided my house, they found four guns there. So ultimately I was charged with the felony possession of firearms and was sentenced to 10 years. And what was your first prison? My first prison <clears throat> was uh, USP Big Sandy. Hold on. Very what's, first one. What's USP? Is that United States Penitentiary? Yes, it is. Maximum security prison? Maximum security, yep. And, you know, we hear a lot of stories about, you know, federal prison being camp fed, that it's, you know, not even close to as bad as state prisons. It's nice. And, you know, <laughs> people are out playing tennis. They're eating good food. What do you got to say about that? Well, I mean, I, I didn't get to witness it. I didn't get to see that aspect of the federal prison system at all. Uh, of course, you know, we were in the maximum security prisons, which is a total different from the lows and the mediums and, you know, the nonviolent offenders, I, I would guess. So how was Big Sandy? Was it a dangerous place? Was it violent? What was going on there? Yeah, Big Sandy, um, you know, as soon as you walk through the doors, it smells like death in there. You just feel it, you know? Yeah. So... And they sent you to a prison like that with a 10 year sentence? With a 10 year sentence. And I, in all honesty, I think it was because I didn't agree to cooperate. I think that they, you know, wanted to teach me a lesson, so to speak. So, so they wanted to teach you a lesson by sending you to what? One of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous federal prison in the system? Yeah, at that time, I think it was ranked number three of the worst prisons in, in the country. There's only 18 uh, United States penitentiaries, and that was ranked number three amongst them all. So, okay. Do you see any violence while you were there? Ah, yeah, every day, every day. The, the prisoners ran that place. You know, the officers didn't have really much control over what was going on in there. Uh, it was like the wild, wild west of, of the prison system. So you're telling you're telling the viewers that were the guards scared of people? Is that what you're saying? Ah, without a doubt, without a doubt, they wasn't coming in there doing anything unless there was four or five of them together with taser guns and stuff. You know, it's a dangerous place, man. And I know you were there at one time. There was a guy that was, um, he was a homosexual, right? And something happened with him in education. Tell the people what happened with him in the education department. He killed someone or something? Yeah, uh, I, I guess they, they raped him there. Trapped him in the education department somewhere and then tried to rape him. And, uh, you know, he killed the guy. I mean, you know, probably fighting for his life, probably, you know, scared to death or whatever the situation was. That was a, a reoccurring theme there. Um, you know, people were getting taken advantage of in that way quite often. Okay. Do you ever see any other incidents or hear about other incidents like that in there? Uh, I was, it was every week somebody was on the verge of death or pretty close to it. Um, you know, I had a few incidents there myself. Uh, uh, you know, two guys got killed while I was there. You know, I actually seen one with my own eyes. The other one, of course, just heard about within the system there. But, yeah, it was a bad place, man. It was dangerous. Uh, and I, I wouldn't imagine the other USPs are much better. I mean, uh, we went to Lee, Virginia after that, another USP, and the violence was sustainable there, too. I mean, it, it was quite a bit, you know. 
Yeah, well, let's talk about this. I know you had an incident. You had a celly that was part of a, a gang. I believe it was Arm Aryan Resistance Militia or something like that named yep. Josh, right? You had an incident with Josh, didn't you? Yeah, well, Josh and I, were we grew up totally different, obviously. You know, I'm, I'm from New Jersey, and, you know, I, I'm a barber. So, you know, uh, I'm more well-rounded, I guess. You know, I, I deal with black people, a couple black people's hair in prison and stuff, and that was frowned upon with the other white guys, especially the gang members, you know? Um, so they they put me in a cell with Josh and, and we shared a room together for a week or so until we had a falling out, um, got into a fight there. Him and his buddy tried to jump me. One of them stabbed me in the neck, stabbed me in the back, but uh, they didn't get me. I was still on my feet when they came in there and broke it up. And you, you, were, you were fighting for your life though, weren't you? Fighting for my life. Yeah, I mean, I'm smiling about it now, but you know, at the time it was uh, probably a near death experience, I guess you could say, you know, but my adrenaline kept me alive and kept me fighting and I'm still here to speak about it today. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about some of the white dudes that you encountered in prison, right? Because you said, you know, you guys grew up different. He was part of a white supremacist, racist type of gang. Right. Um, you know, with the white dudes in there in prison that are involved in that type of stuff, that do they frown upon guys like you that cut black people's hair? And, you know, you grew up around some black dudes, you know, all that type of stuff. So do they frown upon you? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, um, I, I was kind of almost ostracized in a way, you know, like um, not really welcome into their inner circle, which I didn't want to be anyway, you know. Um, I went in there by myself and planned on continuing to do things by myself, which I did to the end. I mean, uh, I think I had one real true friend out of the whole time I was in federal prison, and that's you. I appreciate Honestly. this. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about Josh, because I knew Josh, right? He was kind of arrogant, thought he was a tough guy, all that type of stuff. And I remember looking at dude at that dude, and I knew he, he didn't have a whole lot of time either. And I was like, man, this dude was going to get out and do something stupid, right? Why don't you tell the people what happened yeah. with Josh when he got out of prison? Because I know you know. Yeah, you know, of course, I didn't know him prior to our incarceration. You know, I only met him in there. And uh, when I got out, you know, I looked him up on Facebook just to see what's up with him, what was going on with him or whatever. And uh, it appears that somebody killed him in California. I guess he got out you know, went out there for whatever reasons and he didn't last long out here on the streets with that ad too. Yeah, someone killed him, huh? Yeah, I, you know, I can't imagine him, you know, by looking at his Facebook and stuff like that, it didn't appear to me that he grew up that way either. You know, I think that that was something that he took that role on in prison maybe for whatever reasons, you know. So you think he was faking a little bit in prison? Faking the uh, Without it? a doubt, without a doubt, you know, but. <clears throat> I mean, we've both seen people do that, right? He's not here to defend himself, so. We've seen people in prison that are faking it to make it, right? And I talk about that in my uh -huh. book where I know some guys go in there and they're not tough guys, right? And some of them make it in Big Sandy. Not many, but some of them make it, right? Yep. And I see these guys and I'm like, man, this guy's pretending right here. And I know we were both with a guy named Swift. And it turned out Swift was a pretty violent dude. He ran with the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. But it turned out that he had told on some people in his case, right? And some paperwork went around. But this dude was like six foot one, six foot two. Pretty tough dude, and it turned out he wasn't the dude that he said he was, you know? So, I, I don't know. I mean, I've seen a lot of dudes in there faking it to make it, and do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, 1,000%. I met Swift. I uh, was in the unit with him for a while. Um, they didn't like me, man. They didn't like how I moved. They didn't like what I did. But, you know, I wasn't about to change the way I am for anybody, and I just can't. So. No doubt. That's understandable. Uh, you know, hey. Men respect men, and no matter who you are or what you do. If you're a man, men are supposed to respect men. Right. And, you know, there's a big misconception, at least I believe there's a big misconception about federal prison. And, you know, I was on a show the other day, the after prison show, and the guy had told me, you know, he had asked me, he said he heard that, you know, all the people in the feds are snitches. Is that true? Jeez. <laughs> uh, I mean, maybe nowadays it's it's more common for people to, uh, to snitch and, and do that, but Nah, most definitely not. Um, in the USP environment, if you snitched on anybody, your fellow inmates are going to find out and more than likely probably try to kill you, to be honest with you, you know? And that that's another thing, too. Um, I was unfamiliar with the federal prison system and how it worked, you know, during my sentencing stages and preliminary hearings and all that kind of stuff. Nobody ever explained to me none of that stuff. Now, I'm glad that I didn't agree to cooperate. I'm glad I didn't tell on anybody, but... What I noticed was a lot of those guys that did and was getting time off their sentences for their cooperation or whatever, once they hit the USP, those guys, you know, they find out about it and, and they take it very seriously. So, no, nah, I don't agree with that, that most people were snitches in federal prison, not at all. 
Okay. Well, I agree with the same thing. Like I said the other day, I said most of the guys that are in a maximum security federal prison, 90% of them dudes are the dudes that people told on. You right. Do you agree with that? 1,000%. I'm one of them. I'm a, I'm a victim of that. So let me ask you this, <clears throat> right? Because, you know, I tell people that with blood on the razor wire, you know, we all have a story to tell. And unfortunately, in the society that we live in nowadays, people glamorize the villain. They they glamorize John Gotti and, you know, Bonnie and Clyde, the, you know, mobsters. You know, these are the people that, you know, a lot of young kids look up to, right? Mm -hmm. So I say we got a story to tell. So kids are interested in our stories, right? This isn't scared straight. This isn't 60 days in. I think that right. stuff's all nonsense. But I think that if we have a story to tell, that it's going to grab the kids in the beginning because they want to hear about prison, right? But I also want them to know the other aspects. So if you were talking to your younger self now about crime and the path that you took, what would you tell yourself? <clears throat> I definitely would tell myself not to do it. Just like all the older folks in my life told me or tried to tell me, you know. Um, she's, you know, I would definitely tell myself to uh, not follow that path for sure, you know. Um you know, I always thought that I was a hustler and I, you know, I, I wanted to be in the streets and I thought it was exciting and, and I thought that was the life that I wanted to live. But honestly, now I've been out almost eight years now, out of federal prison for almost eight years now. And I haven't I even had a speeding ticket. You know, I've, my life is totally, completely 180 changed around. And um, I don't want to attribute that to the time that I spent in prison at all. You know, I, I, I feel like it was something within me that changed eventually that, you know, I didn't want to live that life anymore. But if, if I could tell myself something now, well, back then, man, I I don't even know, Chad. To be honest with you, I, there, it's so deep. There's so much to it. It's just um, it's well, a sad situation, man. It's let me stop you. Let me ask you this: Do you think being in prison and the violence that you've seen and the anger that you've seen that it helped click something upstairs in your head where you said, "Man, I don't want to live like this. I don't want to live this life." And what I mean, yeah. what I mean by I don't want to live this life, I mean that prison life, you know, that prison the life, life where right. you're not able to talk to your family, you're not able to eat the food that you want to eat, that, you, you know, you're seeing people get murdered in prison, you're seeing people get stabbed. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Did that make you appreciate your freedom? Oh, of course. One thousand percent. It did. No doubt about it. I mean, by witnessing all that stuff, definitely, um, you know, it definitely did. No doubt about it. One thousand percent. Um, you know, I, I still I still have dreams about prison stuff that we've seen in there and things that, you know, went on and whatnot. I mean, not really nightmares because I didn't experience it myself, you know, that part of things. But just to just to witness it, just to see it, man. Sad situation, really, you know, definitely uh, understandable, man. Yeah. You know, when you see people get killed, I think it affects you. You know, I've seen people killed in federal prison when we we're in Lee yeah. County. I seen a dude killed in our unit, you know, over pretending that he had a knife. He got drunk and. You know, he acted like he had a knife, and the other guy said, hey, you know what? I really do have a knife. Do have one. And he stabbed the dude, and dude was like, man, please don't kill me. And yep. and dude said, man, it's too late for that. And, you know, that's something that affected me, man, to this day, where the guy said, hey, it's too late for that, and he kept stabbing him. And we knew that he was dead because what color was the blood? It was black. I said, man, the Jeez. blood's black. This guy's gone. He's dead. Over a card game and getting drunk, he's dead. And I want kids to realize that, you know, that when you walk into that prison system, these things can happen. But I want to take you on a little bit of a different path, a different different journey. You've been out eight years now, right? Yep. Tell the people what you did when you got out of prison and what you're doing now. <clears throat> well, now I'm a business owner. I started a sign company. Um, so I make signs, vehicle graphics, stuff like that. Um, I took a liking to it as a younger fellow. You know, I was working before I went to prison at a couple of sign companies and I enjoyed it, kind of somewhat of a passion for it. Um, so when I got out, I went to beauty school, got my barber license, all that stuff. And um, as a so, something I can fall back on in the future. But right now, <clears throat> I'm a successful business owner. <clears throat> I have a sign company. I'm doing really well. I've never lived better. Making more money now than I ever did doing the illegal stuff. Hold on, hold on. Or... I got to stop you. <clears throat> Say that again. You're making what? More money now than I ever did with the illegal stuff, honestly. So, And I don't have to look over my shoulder. I don't have to... You know, I can go to sleep at night. I feel good about what I'm doing. Well, that's your yeah. message. That's the message right there for the kids, right? That they can do it. It's hard to take a 16-year-old or a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old and say, hey, look, stop selling drugs because you're going to go to prison. They're not trying to hear that, man. They're not trying to hear that. They're not trying to be broke. 
right now yeah. for when they're 14, 15, 16 years old. They're trying to make a way. But what I think they need to do is learn that, hey, look, it's so much better because you know what? Most drug dealers, almost every drug dealer I ever met, they never retire from drug dealing. Yeah. Most of us go to prison, end <clears throat> up in prison, serving a bunch of time. You're in there bagging people for money for commissary. You're in there hungry. And you know what? It was all for nothing. When you can avoid all that, right, and get your life together. Yep, no doubt. You know what? One thing that I think about a lot is um, a lot of these younger fellas, even people our age used to do it. I, I'd imagine I've seen it a lot. People say I, I, they were a product of their environment, that they had to do those things that they were doing to survive in the environment that they were in. And I get it in a way, you know, because in federal prison, you know, I had to, I'm not a killer by nature. I'm a, I'm a good guy. At least I, I think I am. You know what I mean? I try to be fair with people, respectful, whatnot. But I had to, um, I had to turn on this killer instinct, just dig it from deep inside to survive in there every day. That's the way it was. But when these youngsters say, um, you know, they're a product of their environment or, you know, they have to sell drugs because that's what the only way to make it in their neighborhood or however that works, you know, um, <clears throat> I, I agree with it a little bit, but for the most part, um, uh, lack of lack of opportunity is not an excuse for your behavior, you know. And um, the odds were stacked against me when I got out of prison, a convicted felon, intense parole, you know, all those things. But I, I made it. I did it. You know what I mean? It was a struggle. I was working 40 hours a week and taking a bus two hours down to Philadelphia to see the parole officer three, four times a week. It was tough, but I knew that where I wanted to go in life and where I didn't want to go back to. So I made a conscious choice to, to do what I'm doing today. Well, I definitely appreciate you. And, you know, I appreciate your story and I'm sure that the viewers will appreciate it. You know, a lot of people are drawn in by the blood, the violence, and, and we live that life. You know, when I say that about my book, you know, blood on the razor wire, I read so many books in prison, but these dudes couldn't tell the story that I could tell. They can't right. tell the story that you can tell because they've never been in the places that we've been. It's cool, put on a wife beater, tattoos, get all pumped up, scream, yell. But man, we've been through some shit. We've been through some serious things. We've seen some things that no man should have to ever see, have to ever endure, right? Why don't you tell the people, man, Jeez. what's one of the worst things you've seen in federal prison? Ah, uh, man. Um, I'm not sure, man. I, I've seen so much stuff in there. It's it's ridiculous. You know, I, I was uh, in the day room. You know, it was 120 of us in the big day room, and I'm at a table with a couple other fellows, and we're playing cards, and felt this weird, weird vibe, you know, like something was going on, but I didn't know what. It wasn't right there in our vicinity where we could see it, but it was going on. And uh, come to find out, right behind us, in the room right behind us, a guy was being gang raped in there. He just showed up at the prison. They found out he was a snitch. The guys from his neighborhood, I thought, I guess they thought that was the appropriate punishment for him or however that went. And, uh, man, that was a sickening, sickening feeling knowing that's going on 10 feet away from me behind this door, hearing this guy in there screaming and crying and begging to stop. That's probably one of the worst things I've seen. I mean, I've seen two guys get killed, but that was horrific, man. That was. <laughs> Would you say that was even, that's even worse than, than actually seeing someone get killed? Because then people my have to live with that and is. endure that. Yeah, in my opinion, it is. And you I know what? I agree. And yep. you know, I'm going to ask you one more question. <clears throat> because we were together at one time. We were in USP Lee, right? Yep. It had potential to be dangerous. We've seen people murdered there. And I tell people this all the time. Because people ask me, what was the most scariest moment you ever had in federal prison? And if you remember correctly, there was an incident, right? And me and you ended up going over and politicking it out. It could have been a race riot, right? Why don't you tell mm -hmm. the people about that if you remember? Jeez, yeah, that was serious, wasn't it? Man, we, we had five, six hundred black guys on one side of the prison yard and two or three hundred of us white guys on the other side of the prison yard. And there was getting ready to be a, a race war out there, man. It was serious. Uh, that Yeah, that was scary, too. That was probably one of the scariest moments, too. Because we were trapped on that yard, man. We were fenced in. The gun towers up there, they were cocked and loaded, ready to roll. And uh, if we didn't go out there and talk on... Man, that could have ended up bad, real bad. And that was, over, was the, the that, white guy came there. So I didn't mean to cut you off, but if I'm not mistaken, I think it was the guy came there from another prison and he had a tattoo of a black guy hanging on his back. And, you know, the 
black folks on the yard, they seen that and they didn't like it and they wanted them to uh, remove the tattoo or get rid of the guy. Yeah, I was serious business, man. And that's not, it didn't really have anything to do with us because we're not like that. We were dealing with, you know, black folks from our neighborhood every day and cutting their hair and hustling with them and playing poker with them. And, but we almost got trapped in it. Yeah, that could have been a bad situation, man. Um, yes. So, look, I'm going to give you an opportunity to say what you want to say to the kids, to the folks watching, man. And I want to thank you for coming. And I want to ask everybody, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I promise you there's bigger and better things coming with this channel. This is our first interview. And, you know, I just want to thank you for coming on and thank you for sharing your story, dog. Tell the people what you got to say. Yeah, yeah. thank you, too. I appreciate it very much. Uh, it's an honor to be your first guest. Uh, I, I know that you're going to have some some big and powerful names on here, some probably some famous people too in, in due time, no doubt about it. So it's an honor to be your first guest. And uh, I just want to say thank you, man. I, you know, don't wait till it's too late. Don't wait till they slam that door behind you and give you 20 years for something that, you know, a choice that you could have made different. Uh, can't take back time, man. Time is one thing that we, we can't get it back. So don't lose it, spending it in a, in a prison cell over some poor choices is a bad decision. I did it. I regret it every day. But I'm here. I'm, I'm alive. I'm, I'm able to tell the story. And hopefully somebody out there is listening and choose not to take that path, man. That's all I can hope for, right? Yeah, that's it. Hey, again, man, thank you. We're bringing it real. We're bringing it raw. We're not holding no punches. We're keeping it real. We want people to know what it's like. I want to take people into this prison system. Come on this journey with us. Let us show you what it's really like. And not just the prison system, but we're going to take you into the criminal justice system on Blood on the Razor Wire. Again, hit that subscribe button, and we appreciate you. Thank you.